Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Alrighty, good morning everyone. Welcome to Still Growing Grace, because after all, none of us have arrived. We're all still growing in grace. I remember a time when I thought I... I I got it. I've, I've got the message. I understand grace. <laughs> yeah, I understood a part of it for what limited capacity I had, um, but I didn't get it all. And then I discovered even more grace. And I just looked up at the stars in the sky in a sense and thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to explain this? So there's more, much more. And uh, that's what this program is about, to help us all keep growing and uh, expanding our understanding of God's amazing love and grace for us all. So today what I've got is a, an interview with Brad Jerzak uh, on grace and grieving. Um, this was produced two years ago when we had the Grace and Grieving Conference with Paul Young here in St. Jacob's, uh, Ontario. So um, some of the stuff I'll be referring to is for a conference in January, but that was two years ago. So just just a heads up. Um, hey, good mo Henry Harris, are you serious? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's so cool. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's going to be a really good interview. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to give you guys a heads up on the conference. Uh, this conference is Healing Life's Hurts Through Understanding Forgiveness. And we've got a great lineup of speakers. So uh, the information link is down below. Um, so just uh, uh, click on, just look, scroll down the description below of this broadcast and you'll see the link uh, to Healing Life's Hurts. It's an Eventbrite link. And it, uh, it's going to be, it says it's uh, January 13th, 20th, and 27th, but I think we're probably going to have to add another Thursday night on. We just have too much content. It's just that good. So uh, brace yourself. It is going to be deep and just really amazing. So I hope you guys can all participate in that. All right, let's dig into a really, really good conversation. Um, since Christmas time is a really difficult time for many in their journey of loss and uh, grieving, um, not just grieving loss of loved ones who've passed away, but loss of relationships. People have divorced marriages, and there's a grief attached to that. There are estranged children. There's a estranged family member. You name it, the list is big. Lost a job, a career, something happened, your mobility, uh, all kinds of levels of loss. And how do we walk through it? How do we face it in a, in a healthy way uh, without being drowned in it, without being caught in that spin cycle and we can't get out? That's why these episodes, last week and the next couple of weeks, it's about this topic of, of loss and how to walk through it. So I hope you enjoy uh, today's episode. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to my Canadian friend, Brad Jerzak. He's written a number of incredible books, and hopefully he'll tell you the quick titles and what they're briefly about. And then we're going to get into some of the content from his lens of a conference coming up, Grace and Grieving, Finding Hope in the Pain. That event is happening Saturday, January 18th. But just because that date's happening, the content that we're going to be talking about today is going to be lasting and can be really beneficial as we walk through different stages of life, especially when grief and pain hit. So Brad, uh, where do you live and what books have you written, my friend? So I live in Abbotsford, British Columbia, which is normally kind of a rainforest, but right now it's, it's more like Mississauga or wherever you live. Where do you live, Mike? I live in Southern Ontario, an hour south of Toronto in Elmira, St. Jacob's, Waterloo. Well, I'd like to visit you someday. Um, yeah, and so I, I've been busy writing this year. Um, my most recent books are A More Christ-Like Way and another one called In. Uh, and the subtitle to that is, is uh, Escapes Me Right Now, oh, Inclusion funny. and Incarnation. Incarnation and Inclusion, Abba and Lamb. I have this so, thing right over here. Oh, <laughs> good. Yeah. So A More Christ-Like Way and In are the most, the fresh ones. Um, some of the ones you might be familiar with, A More Christ-Like God. And the gates will never be shut. 
Yeah. So I've been busy. And we also have some kids books. The most recent of those is called Jesus Showed Us. And it's a kids book about how Jesus shows us that God is love all through the Gospels. What? We have to start teaching kids early or what? Well, uh, Paul Young told me it's the best adult retraining book he's seen. And in <laughs> fact, I know somebody right now who's on a 40-day program of just going through it again and again and writing one page at a time, journaling in response to it, seeing transformation. This is wow. someone in their 50s, so they're, wow. it's like a grandma. And Well, sometimes we've, we've made um, the love of God far too complicated with fancy words, and we've lost the essence of it. So you got to become like a child. So I love that. So let me get into a big question about grace and grieving. I know you've got a lot of other topics that I would love to have you speak about. And uh, you're on my um, radar to have come speak. So that's not too far away. I hope we'll, we'll figure something out sometime. But uh, you're the next one I was really hoping to have come. But with this topic of loss, um, in your number of books, you deal with correcting images, not only of God, but of uh, reviewing life circumstances. How, how have you looked at or addressed the idea of grief, misconceptions people have had? Can you, can you start me off with that? I think you have something in your mind already, so I'm just going to let you run with this. Yeah, I think that um, one thing we need to understand is that grief is a normal human response to things that happen in our lives. There's a number of ways that we suffer that are really connected to lies that we believe. Um, but when it comes to things like hurt, anger, grief, even guilt, that these can be burdens that are quite natural to humanity when we experience certain events. So for example, um, if, if, uh, if I lose a loved one, if I were to lose a spouse to death or a toddler, or even uh, apart from death, if we lose a marriage through divorce, if, or if we lose a relationship or a job, these, these are real events, and it's appropriate to feel grief. So the feeling of grief is not the problem. The question is how we're going to process that burden. Do people know they're feeling grief? Um, some certainly do, but they, they may be so swimming in it that they don't even know what they're experiencing it. Um, and it's odd because it's sort of it is a burden that comes on us as a result of something um, now that there, where there's an absence or, or where there's a real loss. So wherever we experience real loss, we will experience this burden of grief. And that's, that's such a normal part of the human condition that, and I'll come back to this later a bit, but the, the Psalms recognize this, that the Psalms of lament are all about grief. And that's mm -hmm. like at least 40% of the 150 Psalms wow. are grieving. And that was in the Jewish hymn book. So that gives permission. It, gives permission it absolutely grieve. does in ways that quite often the church has not. Like, how dare you grieve? <laughs> you should be over this already. And maybe we'll give people a little bit of grace and space to grieve for a few weeks or months. Even, let's say, widows or widowers. But our experience of it is, even if you're, um, even if, even if you're processing grief in a very healthy way, it's normal for that process without even getting stuck to last at least 18 months um, before you see a big shift. And so mm -hmm. sometimes the church has said, look at, do, do you believe in Jesus or not? You know, I, there's, do you believe in his power or not? Why, why aren't you happy yet? It's like, well, my spouse died a year ago. And now they're throwing guilt at them and shame as if, shame. wait a minute, uh, maybe, maybe I'm not processing this right. Maybe I've done this wrong. And people are not comfortable with somebody being uncomfortable. Right. And may, maybe I'm even a bad Christian, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And so then what happens is in that kind of a culture, you end up repressing the grief. And as you, as you push it down and try to put on the happy face, um, we're just not made for that. And what will happen is it will begin to squeeze out. So repressed grief squeezes out in other ways. And those ways can include other um, feelings. Let's say you, gr repressed grief can become depression. It can mm -hmm. become anger. But then also repressed grief can turn into um coping mechanisms we, you've got if you're not allowed to express it you need to cope with it and then that's when we might see people um, uh, trying substance abuse or or whatever uh, addictive behaviors just to sort of numb the grief so all of this happens when we when we don't in a sense welcome the grief and bring that grief into the presence of god where where grace can do its work on it but we mustn't think of that as a drive-through this is you know and so not in this culture. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. And so we just, um, in, in, in normal Western culture, we don't really have a way of dealing with this. There are cultures that understand the time that this takes. And so, for example, both in the Eastern Orthodox uh, Christian tradition, but also in First Nations cultures, a number of them would, would have a, a, a sort of memorial um, one week after the death, one month after the death, six months after the death, one year and two years. Wow. Um, certainly we have those. And it's even when it's a, a 10 minute memorial at the end of a service in where I attend, uh, we, we really see people are allowed uh, to weep, to, to, to weep this out in the presence of safe people and loving friends and family. And so they will wow. gather and, um, and they're allowed to revisit that. They're doing it on their own anyway, but wh when does community become part of that, right? And it's such mm. an important part of grief. Well, there's even a symbol of, of weakness if you're grieving, right? Uh, I, I think it was Paul, and I just, we just did a um, video interview that was aired yesterday, I think, or Tuesday, which was yesterday. Um, but he said uh, uh, he was at an event, and um, um, his wife had, and him had gone through a lot of loss. I'm going to ask them about this in the conference. Um, and his wife couldn't go to the funeral. Of, the, of this uh, young niece who was five or something. And Paul said, she was strong, I was weak because I was able to compartmentalize and I, I didn't allow myself to feel. And she was the strong one. And I, wanna, I want him to explain that one, but that blew me away there for a moment. I thought, we don't think of it like that. We always think it's a, this weakness has to grieve. Right, wow. Yeah, it's, it's really true. And one of the things... Um, I want to just address this idea of it being a burden. What mm. we've noticed is that there, are, um, there's an inner healing approach to this, but there's also sort of a, a journey approach. And I, I think both are necessary. So I, just to address the inner healing, first of all, one of the things I've discovered is that if we treat grief as a burden, it's an emotional burden that we carry in our body. Then I might ask somebody, um, where do you carry this? burden in your body when the grief comes up where do you feel it and it can be it's almost always very specific like whether it's face neck shoulders throat sternum gut you name it people can normally identify where they're carrying their grief wow this is really helpful let's say if you are stuck and it, 10 years later you're still not getting over it that may mean that you're still you've you've still are carrying or clinging to this grief for some reason in your body and then we just do a, a prayer exercise with them where we say, now when you, when you feel that grief there, if you could see with the eyes of your heart, what would it look like? And they will have the, the most imaginative pictures describing the grief, anything from chains to a dark shadow to a big anvil to like, I've heard crazy ones like a big giant black slug on my back or a, or a bolt, a five pin iron bowling ball with spikes on it in my gut or a ball of worms writhing around inside me. And they will, ha they will have these images and it, it's a way to get in touch with what they're feeling and, and to, to see that if they're carrying that kind of grief and it feels so bad and they're wearing it in their body and it looks so bad in the spirit, then this, this is really costing them. And so we'll just pray about that. What has this cost you? and to carry the burden yourself. So we never shame them for having it. The problem is carrying it yourself too far and too long. Mm. And then we'll, um, we'll ask them also, like, so, well, first of all, they'll say, yeah, I, it's cost me relationships, it's cost me joy, it's cost me freedom, it's cost me my job, it's cost me everything in some cases. And then, and then we'll, we'll ask them, is there any reason you need to carry this? So some people believe for example, I need to carry this grief for a lost loved one, or it doesn't mean I love them, or it means I'll forget them, and so mm. on. When in reality, it just means that all their memories are painful, and that without the grief, they could begin to access all the joyful memories, and they're certainly not going to forget them. And then finally, we'll, we'll bring them to Jesus, and we'll say, if you were to let Jesus carry this with you and for you, if you were to surrender that burden to him and um, what would he give you in exchange and so there'll be an exchange there and it will often be very beautiful like i'll take your ball of worms and i'll give you a ball of fiery love you know or wow. i'll give you i'll lift this yoke from your shoulders and i'll give you wings so you can fly again and 
And then we just ask, is that an upgrade you'd want to make? This is Isaiah 61. I will, trading our, our garment of, or uh, the, the grief for joy and um, getting a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness and beauty instead of ashes. So we see that part of the Messiah's anointing is to make these upgrading exchanges. And so with grief, we do that all the time. And that's one of the approaches we take to it inner healing. Wow. Well, the inside stuff, people don't realize it and how they suppressed. And I, I know I, I've been through stuff in my life, no time for sharing that. That's not the point of today, but I've learned through some counseling how repressed it was and how I tried to put it away with vices. Uh, even when I started my counseling, I started to increase my alcohol intake. And it was not good, you know, because my, and then my counselor helped me see I was doing that so I didn't have to feel anymore. Right. You were and medicating. It's just, and, and it's not like you're a bad person. It's not a moral problem at all. It's a medication problem. It's like, yeah. you, and so. Well, when I was told that yeah. it almost, it almost would like chains fell off instantly. Wow. And I was able to continue counseling and uh, three years of counseling has brought me through a lot of tremendous healing. So now I get to help others in their journey too. And it's, right. it's quite incredible. So you when you mention three years, that means we're not just, again, not just doing like my little prayer exercise really can help, but that's mm -hmm. one layer. You may need to journey this out mm -hmm. and you need permission to do so. Yeah. And mine there's was, ways mine to was related it. to abuse. That was mm. happened, sexual abuse, just like with Paul Young. And so that took a little longer and I'm 51 now. So 45 years of not resolved stuff. Right. Right. Yeah, that's not going to go away with the snap of the fingers. But, <laughs> no. Um, in your union with Christ, you can begin to, to release it layer by layer, right? You had mentioned some Psalms before that you'd like to uh, touch on uh, where you have encouraged people. Do you want to get into that? Sure. And um, so I'll even use a specific story and then I'll read you these two short Psalms. So this specific story is about a girl who um, she, she became a Christian when she was 14 and then the day she became a Christian, she fell ill. And it, it was uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia set in from that day on. So talk about, talk about a, a robbery. Inviting Christ into your life, and this is the gift I got. And what happened is I only met her in her early 20s. And so she had lost, her grief was over. All her teen years were lost. She could not experience any of the things that teenagers would hope for. Um, and so much of the time she was bedridden or she must have been when she angry. Oh yeah. Hurt, <clears throat> anger, but, but under that was the grief, right? And that needed to be expressed. So I met her at this discipleship training school where she had sort of forced herself to get there and then she'd stay in her room, but as much as she could, she, she was trying to fight. Um, and so she would come to, the odd session. And finally I had a one-on-one -on -one and she just told me her story. And I, I just, I felt so horrible. And I thought, I can't fix you. I have a, I have a list of people I pray for with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and they almost never get healed. And, it, and so you've got this chronic grief connected to body pain. So, um, but I had a, I had a, what I now see in retrospect as a nudge from the spirit. And um, she happened to be from Quebec, so I said, let's read Psalm 6 together. I can't help you, but what I could do is hold your hand and cry with you. And I want you to read Psalm 6 out loud in your first language, which was French. So here's what she read. Now imagine somebody grieving seven years of loss due to chronic fatigue. And she begins reading, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver me, save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I'm worn out from groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my co uh, couch with tears. By now, she's just sobbing because this is her life, right? And she's allowed to say it in the presence of God with conviction and like, and in, in fact, the beginning of the Psalm, it's almost like God has done this to her because she has become, a, you know, a Christian and got this horrible curse, but then it shifts. 
Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. So the, the groaning and lament is an acceptable prayer to God. Mm. And she says, wow. and all my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish, will turn back and suddenly be put to shame. And um, so she caught her breath. And I said, I want you to do one more. So she reads this one from Psalm 13. So maybe your listeners can have this in mind. When they're facing grief, Psalm 6 and 13 are two short psalms that when you don't know what to say, the mm. Holy Spirit's given us these words and the permission to share them. Wow. So Psalm 13, how long? Because we, we pray that a lot, right? She, how long? When is this going to end? Lord, will you forget me forever? So it's almost like, oh, you can't pray that because we know theologically God doesn't. It's like, no, but part of your heart feels that and you need to bring that to, into his presence. Mm. How long will you hide your face from me? Again, he doesn't ever, but that's how we experience grief. Mm -hmm. How long must I wrestle? with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow grief in my heart how long will my enemy triumph over me look on me and answer O lord my god give light to my eyes and or i will sleep in death and my enemy will say i've overcome him and all my foes will rejoice when i fall but and here's again now the psalm's going to help them process but i trust in your unfailing love it's like actually i don't but i'm going to pray it anyway because <laughs> Being real includes telling, saying the truth when it doesn't feel true. My heart rejoices in your salvation, even though my heart doesn't rejoice in your salvation. Oh, I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. And uh, at, at that point, what it's, it's, the psalm has taken their reality and now it's just leading them along towards a few words of faith. Mm -hmm. Here's what happened to her. Um, nothing that day. We just cried a bit. And then she went off back to her room. And the next morning, um, I did a prayer exercise similar to what I just shared with you with the whole group. And I said, we're going to go to Jesus at the cross and we're going to lay our burdens down with him. Whatever your burden is, hurt, grief, guilt, anger, or even people you're carrying. And we're going to meet Jesus at the cross. But he's not hanging on the cross. He's in front of the cross. The cross reminds us of his victory over these things. But the fact that he's standing in front of it with open arms reminds you he's also risen and alive and has life to give. And so I, we did a brief prayer where uh, we said, whatever, whatever burden you're bringing, we want, we're, we're inviting you to surrender that to Jesus and receive a gift of this love. And I, I just sort of prayed them through that. And then we ended the meeting and I had to race off to a, a you know, the airport. And I didn't hear from her again for years. And then one day on Facebook, I get this message from her. And it says, uh, this is years later. And, and, and she says, I, I don't know if I remembered to tell you the day we left our burdens at the cross, I was completely healed in my body. And it's sort of like as she let go of the burden of grief, something came off her body. And now she said, and I just want you to know, I'm, I actually got my life back. And I've met a man and, and I married him. And look at, here's a photo of us with our first child, you know? And so you must've been blown away. I was blown away. I was angry that I prayed, wasted all those years praying for her. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, I, but I, and I wish it was always like that. That's part of the, part of the issue with, with grief is um, that's a great story because it ends well there. But what about the ones who, you know, she still didn't get her teen years back. Mm -hmm. She gets her life back, but, but there was a real and permanent loss. And for others, when they, let's say, uh, through death or whatever, you, um, the, the truth is circumstances don't change for a lot of people. But what can change is that when we bring our grief into the presence of God, he is willing to, he, what's Isaiah 53 say? I will bear all your sins and, all your sorrows. Mm. So somehow um, he may bear those sorrows for us, or he, we may experience him, him bearing them with us, even while we still also carry them. But now it becomes about union instead of isolation and separation. Can, can you read that sign behind your head? Yeah, my, my, uh, this is a, the, word, the word of the year from my wife, Eden. 
And um, I think I could share this. She, she's going through uh, health issues and, and, um, and we've also experienced some great losses uh, in terms of, of relationships in our family. And so out of a place of real grief, this is what we believe the Lord gave her. Our hope is not in a particular outcome, but in God who can do more than we ask or imagine. And so um, that means we have to surrender the means by which he brings his mercy into our lives, into his care. So mm. we absolutely, we pray, Lord, have mercy a lot. What we mean by that is that whatever our grief, whatever our situation, we believe absolutely in the infinite mercies of God pouring down on us like um, Niagara Falls. And, and when we say, Lord, have mercy, we're not activating his mercy. It's more like we're purposely coming under the waterfall and orienting ourselves to receive that mercy. But you don't get to dictate what that will look like. And sometimes we're... What? We, but we're we, control freaks. Right. So we have expectations about if God is good, it must look this way. And it what didn't look this way, so maybe he's not good. But what she's saying is, no, God is God. Or you say, I want what they had. I want their answer. Yeah, yeah. And fair enough. Like, let's say this. Um, we can grieve that, you know. <laughs> we didn't get their answer. This 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 girl got um, freedom from chronic fatigue, and this one didn't. And she what, fair. it's fair for her to wish she had been healed. But mm -hmm. um, I wonder what mercy could look like for her in the midst of that, and it will have something to do probably with community and fellowship, both with people and, and with God, uh, and understanding that the Bible says that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. There is nothing we grieve that Christ has not directly experienced, and I'm not just talking about his own grief. grief Jesus grieved stuff in his life, but I mean he's directly united with our he knows those losses in in his at the very deepest levels of his soul where he chooses never to repress them or numb them. I, I have talked to, at many funerals uh, about the story of Jesus showing up late for his best friend's funeral, not just 10 minutes, like four days late. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus is the son of God, fully God and fully man, why in the world did he weep? Mm -hmm. And so far, the conclusion I've arrived at is because he's fully human too. Yeah. And he identified with the pain of those. He didn't say, oh, you guys stop it. You don't have to feel that because I'm going to raise from the dead. Get over it. He was in the moment. He felt everyone's grief around them. He was focused on who was in front of him. And that's a lesson for all of us. I don't know. I did, that, was, that was pretty cool. When I first caught that, it changed the story for me. Yeah, that sounds exactly right to me too. Um, that for him to be fully human means uniting himself to the fullness of the human experience and, and, and not um, sort of this aloof Jesus who actually dehumanizes the grieving process. That's just not him. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I just saw a post yesterday, I think, that you talked about one of your books being about surrender. Yeah. If somebody is struggling with not just grief, but letting go, is, is this book that you're referring to about that? Yeah, if they get a more Christ-like way, um, the key passages in there about this are... It's probably backwards on the screen, but oh well. No, it's, it looks right to me Good. anyway. Um, so I noticed yesterday that I, the word surrender came up 96 times in the book. That's and I'm like, lot. wow, this, I guess this is a big deal to me. And it came up in a lot of different topics, everything from from prayer to grief to addictions counseling to an enemy love um and all of these kind of really hard things and really the prototype for this is jesus christ himself in the garden of gethsemane mm -hmm. and he so he bears the, he's not weeping because he's gonna die the next day He's weeping because he's bearing the sorrow of all people all t at all times in that moment mm -hmm. and willingly so. And so, so that's a pretty big deal. Um, here's the dilemma. Um, when people are facing um, especially enormous grief, they can confuse surrender and resignation. 
let's say someone has terminal cancer, for example, and I may even mention this in the book uh, about a child who was dying with cancer. And so on the one hand, you, you don't want to just resign yourself to the cancer. You want to fight it. But on the other hand, sometimes in our fighting it, we won't allow ourselves to grieve. So how do you, how do you both um, oppose the thing that wants to be the thief of your life? and not give into it while at the same time allowing room for yourself to go through a grieving process. And, and I feel like people, people can end up abandoning those folks in one of two directions. Either you're like, no, we need to be people of faith who fight this and we're going to just do positive confessions and we're going to pray command prayers and we're going to do all this stuff. Meanwhile, the person's grieving and, and they're all alone in their grieving. Mm -hmm. The other is, we may just resign to the cancer, like, okay, we're going to go through this grieving process, and now they've been abandoned. No one's praying for healing for them. It's like, but how do you pray for healing and pray for and process grief at the same time? Here's, here's what I believe. Rather than resigning to the grief and rather than denying the grief, so that's the two ditches. I resign to the grief or I'm in denial of the grief. Instead, I surrender. And what I do is I surrender myself to the care of a loving God. And I, pic I literally picture putting myself or my loved one in his hands. Mm. Surrendering to his hands is, is a way uh, to enter the grieving process, but it may also be the, their best chance of being supernaturally healed. But doesn't so that, doesn't surrendering that to his you? care. Doesn't that require you then to take these, this control and open it and say, Father, take out and put in whatever you want. I surrender. Yeah, that's exactly right. We, I, in fact, in the book, I, go, I, use, I use hands as the illustration <laughs> where we move. It's, it's a three-part move in my case, and this would be certainly true in 12-step in, uh, in recovery, for example. So you move from clenched fists of self-will and control which are usually the cause of the problem in the first place. Hmm. Um, and then uh, let's say with an addict, for example, they're, they're going to bottom out. The bottoming out doesn't mean, doesn't technically mean life must get as bad as it can possibly get. Bottoming out is when you go from clenched fist to limp wrist. Uh, 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 where, uh, and that can become just despair. Mm -hmm. But it, um, you come to the end of yourself. And you realize I'm powerless over this and I can't control it anymore. But then we, third part, then you roll the hands over into surrender and receive. Okay, I'm stealing that. Please do. And so, <laughs> so clench fist, lip wrist, open hands. And so in the open handed thing, what I'm saying is we're surrendering our lives and our will to the care of this loving God. But in, in, in opening our hands to do so, we are actually maximizing what we can receive in terms of grace. Have you got time for one more question? I sure do. Um, somebody asked me recently, um, a funeral director asked me, how do you handle Christian joy boys or joy girls who put on a plastic smile and say, well, I'm supposed to be a Christian and be happy that they're in a better place. And they don't, they're, they kind of feel like they're not allowed to grieve because they're Christians and they're, they're in my mind, they're totally screwing up what Christianity really is. And they've, I don't know where they're getting this stuff from. I'm sure you've seen it. Do you, do you understand my question? Yeah. The worst case I ever saw that was we were, I was at an open, I, I was the minister at an open casket funeral for a baby that had died. We're talking about not quite two years old and they had the casket open and we're looking at this little doll like figure. And then, and then we go to the, um, that was bad enough. It was so hard, so hard. And, but then we went to the, what do you call them? Cemeteries. We went to the yep. cemetery. They closed the casket and you could just feel something, right? And then they're lowering the casket into the dirt and then they're take a shovel and then a pe the dirt goes on top of the casket. And so we're very aware because, because it had been an open casket of what's happening. And, and so, um, the, the wife absolutely fell apart at that point. And, but the husband went into Pentecostal joy boy, oh. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He's, this is his kid at, at the cemetery and hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And you can, you, 
you could just see this guy is about to blow up, but this is his way of not, and and I don't. Um, it didn't end well. Let me put it that way, uh, for that family, and it, it was very sad. And and uh, eventually, um, you know, my suspicion is someone like that, um, if they don't have a breakdown, they'll certainly need to use coping mechanisms and, and addictions to deal yeah. with it. But what to do about it, I I hardly know. Um, I may, I may have not is not a healthy expression at all. That's oh, good Lord. No. To say. no, that that's so it's so dehumanizing. It's so about escape at that point. We're escaping right. reality instead of accepting what is. And I'm not saying that we accept in the sense of affirming the power of death or something like that. But we yeah. do have to say that here is reality and what we're facing and we're going to face that reality in the presence of love of God. But often we've, we've, we've shifted that to like pretending that in, in, so my good friend, Lori Martin, uh, who has lost a daughter, uh, she said what she's seen in a lot of believers is they do the raw, raw thing and they think it's that they're triumphing in the resurrection, but they're still stuck at the triumphal entry because they've not passed through wow. the crucifixion. And so when someone I like that and, um, and so when you try to prop up triumphal entryism, um, I believe that becomes toxic and I would say exhausting. And so sometimes I've been able to crack through denial, not like Dr. Phil does. It's like <laughs> his thing is how's that working for you? Yep. You know, um, <laughs> but I, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. But I, what I do is I'll, I'll try and go through the empathy door and empathize with feelings that they're not allowing themselves to have. And the question yeah. I, I will say is like, so what are you experiencing? And they're, and whatever they say, even if it's like, I'm just like, I'm just all in for Jesus, and, you know, he's the victor and all that. Or it's just by asking them, they may, they may open their hearts, but here's the magic question. I think it's like, Oh, it's not a question. Well, it is sort of, I'll say that must be exhausting. And then you just see their bodies go. Yeah. And, and when they, when they can admit how exhausting it is to the soul to to really bear that grief themselves by trying to compartmentalize it, hide it. And like, what if he, what if Jesus wants to carry that for you? So I would say grief is absolutely allowed. It's absolutely human. Um, but you don't need to bear it on your own. I'll bear it with you and we'll bear it as far as the cross. And then we'll see how Christ will want to bear it. And so co-suffering love is a word I use a lot. Co-suffering love. That is, he, uh, he, he doesn't stuff suffer instead of us so that we are not supposed to suffer. He suffers with us and in us as we suffer. And yet somehow that can lighten the yoke. Hmm. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for the time today. That, that was really awesome. I think, uh, I hope we can have another conversation like this. This topic is way too big. And I think more people need help because that guy who used that, uh, you know, praise the Lord, somebody taught him to say that. What? Yep. Children don't say that. Right. So some, it was religion. So yeah. Anyway, let's, let's find some hope in this, uh, in this pain. And uh, there is grace in grieving. And uh, thanks again for your time today. Do get a Paul Young hug at the conference because that, that will, that will go a long ways. The grand embrace of God embodied in my friend, um, is a is a good model for what's he's a walking store. hug yeah <laughs> <laughs> awesome all right we're gonna end this off here i'll stop the recording but thank you so much brad brad jerzak author of a more christ-like way um ordered off amazon uh, asap it's a great read so are those other books oh by the way ha huh, paul young did the forward ah, i just noticed that indeed he did best part of the book okay okay all right, we're uh, ending this here. Thanks, everyone, for taking time to uh, tune in and listen to this uh, really important topic. Wow. Oh, wow. I can say that backwards. Wow. I hope you enjoyed that. That was, uh, I forgot the content. And again, I'm watching with you live. 
uh, as this is the interviews being played uh, every Wednesday. I do that if even though we pre-record the interviews because nobody gets up at 8 a.m. ready for an interview Eastern Standard Time <laughs> to do a program with me. We do it in advance, but <clears throat> to listen again, it's like oh my goodness, I I I need to meditate on that yet one more time. Like there was so much in the conversation that um, I need to digest. There were some real nuggets there. I love that uh, clenched fist, limp wrists, open hands. <laughs> that was smart. That's a, a process. And maybe that'll help us identify where people are at in their process. You can tell, are they in the clenched fist stage? Um, that was good. And that whole idea of um, um, the praise the Lord, charismatic, um, uh, the naive way of facing and trying to hyperventilate yourself into faith. That's what that person was doing. And that's not true faith. That's, that's a fake human faith um, that thinks you can, with your mind, get out of this. No such thing. I was uh, one of the interviews that uh, uh, I had with the forgiveness conference. Um, uh, one of the participants. It was with Catherine Toon. Um, we were talking about the cognitive way of coping with life uh, versus the heart and emotional and the connections way, and it just reminded me of that. That many people try to live from the cognitive only because they think they're so smart that they figured it out so well. They've got the, the system, the cubby box is, is clear cut and it's, it's not, it'll work for a while, but like a Brad said, burnout's coming, baby. You know, you cannot maintain that kind of intensity. Oh boy. All right. Let's say hello to some who are watching joy. Good morning in Guelph. Yeah. <laughs> Paul's hug is amazing. And uh, I, I'm glad you enjoyed what you just heard. Anna, I'm glad you tuned in late. Uh, go back and watch. The, the, the interview was incredible. I loved it. Lisa, good morning. So good to, to have you watch this morning. And Linda, down from, uh, where are you from again? Wallaceburg, yes. I keep forgetting the name of that little town. But I'm glad for all that are watching. If you're watching later, can you? comment and just say hey i'm watching from and tell us where you're watching from it's really helpful because even though it's not live the shared comments keep going and i'll respond to comments as i'm able um but yeah share this thing all right lastly this is what i really want to um remind you of we have a, a wonderful conference coming up in january and you need to register for this event it's called healing life's hurts through understanding forgiveness now we just talked about grief but Forgiveness is another major category uh, that contributes to our healing. And so we've got a number of really, really good guests there. Uh, there's one person off the list on this one, uh, Libby Briscoe. Uh, I forgot to update the photo on this, but uh, she's added. And I'm hoping for one more if, if that person will get back to me. Um, but this is a really good list of individuals who uh, are contributing. And I've, I've got a lot of... Of material, we're going to probably have to go to a, to a third, um, a third, uh, a, sorry, a fourth Thursday night for that conference. Hello, Naya from Cameroon. Seriously, you're watching from Cameroon? Oh my goodness! Welcome. How did you hear about this? This is cool. Um, but it's an honor to have you watch from Cameroon. I don't have many uh, watchers from uh, from the African nation, so uh, I'm blown away by that. Uh, oh, that's not, in I'm wrong. I'm sorry, I'm getting my, my geography messed up. Anyway, uh, pleasure having you on board and watching. I hope you're encouraged. If you didn't hear the beginning of this, then uh, oh, go back and watch. There's some powerful stuff there. Okay, I got to wrap up because uh, a lot's going on today. Uh, next week, we're going to continue in this uh, series on grief, grace grace and grieving. Um, I believe it'll be Paul Young, uh, part of the conference that happened two years ago. So we jump into that part. So there's three different, three. the next three weeks will be Paul Young speaking uh, from two sessions from the evening conference and then the Sunday morning one. And then in January, we're into the uh, Healing Life's Hurts Through Understanding Forgiveness event. I think you guys are going to love this. So share away and uh, look forward to seeing you all next time. All right. Thanks for watching. 
Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.